Now you're talking about sneaky, dirty, underhanded people that want to kill our civilians. I would bomb the hell out of ISIS, yes. I'm going to bomb the shit out of them. It's true. I don't care. I would bomb the shit out of them. During this last election cycle, President-elect Trump found himself an unusual friend. As you can see, even though Trump promised to bomb the caliphate, ISIS still wanted him as a leader of the free world. This can't mean anything good. We believe that ISIS can use Donald Trump's Islamophobia and warmongering policy to ultimately recruit more followers. Our goal is to explore this idea, and to explore what a Trump presidency could mean for the Middle East as a whole. Here's what our interviewees had to say. So I'm from Pakistan and um, I think, um, to be honest, I'm very confused by Trump and his policies because he recently had a phone call, was on a phone call with my country's president where like he had great things to say about my country and didn't really have anything to say about the terrorism aspect of it. And since we're not directly connected to ISIS, I don't know what, like, what he's going to do about that, but generally I think like maybe there'll be some extra red tape against like Muslims generally and that may affect me. Yeah. So I'm from Kenya and I'm not entirely sure that the effects on ISIS in my country is particularly huge. Being very close to Somalia we do have some influence from um, groups such as Al-Shabaab and so if Trump stands on ISIS is particularly effective, maybe that will have an effect on Al Shabaab that will spill over onto mm. Kenya, whether positive or negative. And so I'm not entirely sure about that. That's okay, so the first article that I'm going to talk about is Hussein Haqqani's Islam's Medieval Outposts. And the point I'm going to make from the article in this video is that Haqqani claims that most underprivileged students in Afghanistan, Pakistan, Iraq and other Islamic countries are being taught in anti-Western madrasas that harbor militant Islamist ideals from a young age. So the first quote that I'm going to uh, bring from the article is, but over the last two decades, revolution, great power politics, and poverty have combined to give the fundamentalist teachings at some of the madrasas a violent twist. So the reason why, the, the way that Donald Trump's election relates to that is that, as that quote says, it's politics that are resulting in violent ideologies being spread and increasing from that. So the implication that Donald Trump's election has on this is that if, in fact, great power politics are encouraging more people to become radical, then when Donald Trump says the things that he's been saying, it can totally be used in the madrasas to harbor more uh, anti-Western thoughts. The second quote that I'm going to talk, that I'm going to uh, bring from the article is, Madrasas would provide an education of sorts, but they would also serve as a center of indoctrination and motivation. Now this quote is just to, uh, again, reiterate the fact that these Madrasas are sources of indoctrination and motivation. So um, these are the places, and as a matter of fact, in the article also talks that says that there are about six million people currently in madrasas right now. So if in fact these madrasas are using Donald Trump's election as a way to harbor more anti-Western thoughts, then um, we really need to be careful about what what is said and also keep an eye out for. Um, increased radicalization in these in these places. And the last quote I'm going to talk about is Tahir, the seventh of nine children, likes being at the madrasa because it provides him an education without costing his parents anything. So this this quote is just to to show that people are going to these madrasas because there is a financial incentive and the reason why that the financial issue may be a, a, a there 
is because of militaristic uh, intervention in those countries that are causing the place they used to live in to become in shambles. So if people aren't having enough money, but they still need, need an education, they're more likely to go into madrasas with these ideologies or with more radical ideologies, if that's the only thing available. So if Donald Trump is saying that he's going to bomb these countries, and if these, and if these bombings make these countries also in shambles, then this too can encourage more radicalization and more anti-Western thought. And that's the end of this article. As president-elect, uh, his uh, what he's talking about doing, and we have seen that a lot of things he has talked about doing, he has begun to backtrack somewhat. So we don't know exactly what he's going to do. We know what the rhetoric has been throughout the campaign and how, how many commentators are saying today that we have to recognize campaigning and governing is two different issues. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Uh, so what he actually is going to do, how would it affect people wanting to embrace Islam? That's really hard to tell. <clears throat> it's really hard to tell. Uh, some people may look at that as an injustice to Muslims if he's attacking ISIS and killing innocent men and women. Uh, they may look at that. And then some people may be intimidated to even become a Muslim because as we know that throughout the campaign, it has raised a lot of uh, prejudices and persecution, whether it's verbal, in some cases been physical, against Muslims because of the rhetoric that has been espoused. The question about the success of being able to put ISIS out begs the question of who exactly ISIS is. Mm. And because ISIS is very well incorporated into cities with a lot of civilians mm -hmm. and so the question about bombing people naturally raises the question about bombing civilians and so i'm not entirely confident that you can effectively carry out a full swipe of isis without killing civilians in the process um i don't think he's gonna be very successful because i think that um u.s foreign policy on terrorism has always been like it's been pretty strict it's not lenient and it's not like flexible or anything and they try their best to like do as much as they can to put down terrorism and since like presidents like Obama haven't been able to do much I don't know what Trump will be able to do I don't think he's gonna make any uh, uh, progress on fixing the problem to be very honest he may like bomb the crap out of them but like like the whole idea that terrorism is an ideology and if you bomb them you can't really finish them using that so yeah working with the citizens there who are willing to fight ISIS and kick them out, you see. I don't think bombing is the right. You need a boot on the ground. But America you now, the American people are not willing to uh, send their kids again after failure in Afghanistan and Iraq. So I think we need to work out a workable plan with the European unions, with with the region, with the Arab League, with any country who is willing to kick them out, with the Kurdish people, with moderate Arabs, that's the plan. Or you cannot win a battle from air. They are dug down for the last two years. And this is guerrilla war, you say guerrilla war cannot be won by air. It's this is the drone also, is creating more enemies, you see. Mm -hmm. but it's, it's not the right. So the Air Force should be used to accompany, to collaborate with the ground troops raised by the um, National Army or National for Security Forces in both countries. That's the best way. We need to clear the land and hold the land. Mm -hmm. Otherwise, ISIS would come again. So you see, the drone, you see, doesn't discriminate. Mm -hmm. The drone kills anyone, you see. That's the problem, and I heard from American experts that we are creating more enemies in this way. 
in Pakistan, Afghanistan, hospitals were destroyed, civilians were killed. But it is the most effective weapon now. You don't need to send the troops. You kill your enemy. But there is collateral damage always. I, I think there's just a, like a general feeling of like being unsafe in America just because you're a minority. In terms of what Trump will actually do, I'm, I'm not sure just because he's so volatile and he, you know, kind of just says whatever he feels like saying. So there's like definitely like a real and present danger, but I don't really know what that could be just because I don't think anyone, even Trump, knows what he's going to do next. Right. I think it's also, like, like Grace said earlier, he was really vague on what his plans were, which I think is... Um, a little expected considering it's just a like a victory speech he's not trying to convince anyone of like he's not trying to like have a discussion on what he's going to do next um, so it's kind of hard to predict and to be honest I'm not I'm not entirely sure like what the current plan is so like how far removed is bombing the hell of, out of ISIS like from current foreign policy in the region uh, having a massive bombing campaign will probably produce a lot of like collateral damage or casualties among civilians, so that tends to engender a lot of ill will towards whoever did the bombing. Uh, it can, it can uh, raise more uh, uh, converts to ISIS because of that. <clears throat> and, and a lot of that you have to understand too. A lot of the people that support ISIS obviously, obviously, are not clearly in touch with our religion. Because mm -hmm. there's no way you can be on the side of ISIS knowing what our religion says. The anti Muslim sentiments that are present in Trump's rhetoric will be used by ISIS because no other world leader has been as vocally anti-Muslim as he has. Mm -hmm. And so that will be used as a foundation to build on more hate and more division for people, and it will be used. Thank you. Um, I think probably yes, and also the uh, whole uh, problem that like Trump being so racist and Islamophobic uh, kind of gives the American population who have such sentiments uh, the leeway to express these sentiments and when they'll do that like Muslims will become more anti-Western culture and like that'll definitely help ISIS. Yeah. I tell you ISIS is a bad group, brutal group rejected by the majority of Muslims. So but his stance is not helpful. You see, his rhetoric against Muslims is not helpful. Because now we have 10 Muslim countries fighting with the United States, contributing to the air campaign against ISIS. Already the Muslims are engaging ISIS, kicking them out. Who is fighting them now? The people there. But they, the people, they need support. Well, this is, you see, is Islamophobia. Or, this is not helpful, you see. This is a country that is built by the best minds in the world who came to the United States. And we need to recruit the Muslims as partners, not as enemies, you see. Isolating them, marginalizing them is not going to work. So we need the Muslims, we need them as source of intelligence, we need them as partners. Not as enemies, you see, or skeptical, you see, corner them. It's not going to help. So I think his approach is not the right one. And uh, I'm sure he will change. By time, he will learn more. He's not a politician, you see. He's a businessman, and, and I think he will learn, and he's learning now. Well, any rhetoric against 1.5 Muslims the second largest religion in the world. It is not ideology, as some say. It is a religion. The second largest religion. To isolate such people, how many American embassies are there in Muslim countries? 57 embassies there. How much interest we have there? So he should understand the implement of 
such Islamophobic or attacking Muslims. This is campaign rhetoric. Okay, so the second article that I'm going to talk about is Henry Munson's Lifting the Veil, Understanding the Roots of Islamic Militancy. And the point I'm going to bring from that article to relate to Donald Trump's election impacting ISIS is that Munson writes that poor people are more likely to join the cause after the cause, and by cause I mean um, anti-Western thought or radicalization, um, after feelings of impotence, humiliation, and rage that come with post-war impoverishment or general unfortunate circumstances, such as being um, their country being bombed for as a result of war as well too, or of other reasons, such as terrorist attacks, etc. So the first quote I'm going to bring from that article is, Most of those surveyed had unfavorable attitudes towards the United States and said that their hostility to the United States was based primarily on U.S. policy rather than on their values. Now, this has huge implications for Donald Trump's election because if it's U.S. policy that's causing people to become anti-Western, um, and if, if, if Donald Trump's U.S. policy of, w that he suggests he's going to do of bombing other countries is going to upset more people, then that's not going to make the situation any better. If anything, it's going to encourage more people to be involved in anti-Western movements because they feel against, strongly against the U.S. policy. So Donald Trump and the government need to be very careful with what they do and then need to keep in mind the reactions that they're going to get from other countries. Um, so the second quote I'm going to bring from the article is, Eradicating or at least curbing Palestinian terrorism entails reducing the humiliation, despair, and rage that drive many Palestinians to support militant Islamic groups like Hamas and Islamic Jihad. So what this quote is, what the point that can be made from this quote is that when people are bombed or attacked, there is a resulting humiliation and anger that results from it that also encourages people to become very violent. Um, in this case, particularly, it's the Palestinians. But this can, this can be expanded to any, anybody's country that's being bombed. And if Donald Trump says he's going to go bomb other countries because ISIS is there and if he, he impacts civilians, then this, this, there will be despair and rage, I'm sure. And um, it, that, that it would, according to this quote, result in more radicalization as well. The third quote I'm going to talk about is... Indeed, the Bush administration's war on terror has been a major reason for the increased hostility towards the United States. Now, this quote is just to show that um, you, we really need to be careful about the approach that we make because in the past, it's the approach that has been made that has resulted in more radicalization and more anti-Western thought. And then the last quote I'm going to talk about is most Muslims see the U.S. fight against terror terror as a war against the Islamic world. Now again, this is also just to reiterate the fact that we really need to be careful with the approach to ensure that civilians aren't attacked or targeted and that they don't feel that they are being negatively affected due to other organizations because if they do, then that will maybe make them more likely to join those anti-Western movements. And that is the end of what I'm talking about with this article. Here is the task that's on us as Muslims in the United States of America. The task on us is a couple of things. One is to present the picture of our religion as clear as this war, mm. like Muhammad the Prophet's life. Yeah. Clear, clean, okay, no ambiguities, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. no doubts, the clarity of the religion. We have to do that, present the right picture of our religion. <clears throat> we also have the responsibility to help fight against these ideas that work to corrupt the perception of our religion. So that's our job. The Muslims themselves now 
Trump won the election. Surprisingly, probably he himself was surprised. In order to change the sentiment anti-Islam, I think the Muslim community should come out and embrace the American values, the American democracy, support the American constitution, and engage in public services. Come out and say hello to your neighbors, participate in events, get involved in society, let the people know you. I think this wave of hate is going to die out in the ocean, huge ocean of American democracy. It will die, you see, out. But we need all, all segment of society to come together. Well, the Muslims now should come out, speak out, and send a message to the public that they are here to embrace the American values, the American democracy, and get involved in the American culture. In the Atlantics, what ISIS really wants, Graham Wood asks where did ISIS come from and what are its intentions? When exploring these questions, Wood brings up the controversial question of whether or not ISIS is an, is, is, is an Islamic organization. He wrote that, Muslims can reject the Islamic State. Nearly all do. But pretending that it isn't actually a religious, militarian group with theology that must be understood to be combated has already led the United States to underestimate it and back foolish schemes to counter it. The case that ISIS is, 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 is an Islamic organization has merit, but what is important is to realize that ISIS uses militarized, harsh interpretations of a peaceful religion. Furthermore, Osama bin Laden and Abu Bakr al-Baghdadi's radical interpretation of not, is not reflective of the religious beliefs that most Muslims follow. Much like the Ku Klux Klan does not represent mainstream Christianity, ISIS does not represent commonly accepted Islamic values. I don't want anything associated with our religion as a phobia. But also we do have to understand that some people have a legitimate concern with being fearful of what's projected as our religion. Yeah. So that you can't you can't blame people always. Now, as a as a man who's running for the highest office of our country and one of the probably one of the biggest influent influential persons that will be in the world when you take that office of President of the United States of America, they owe the country, they owe the world to be more informed about our religion. That's a really good point. They owe the world that. To be, we represent one-fifth of the world's population. That means they should know more about our religion and they should be able to make the distinction of what is truly the religion versus people who are hypocritical in that, religion. That's actually exactly what I was about. I'm co-president of J Street U Duke and I with J Street U is a university arm of an organization that fights for two states in Israel and Palestine. We often draw on a lot of Jewish religious teachings to motivate our actions and that's a large part of what motivates me actually. Um, I'm also very involved with the religious life itself, not just cultural. I attend Shabbat services just about every Friday. Went to my holy days, have ever since I was a kid. Um, and so, I, I would say I'm a leader within the Jewish religious community at Duke University. So, I think my first thought on this question is what we define as Trump's stance. If we define as his stance that he is anti-ISIS, yeah, most Jews will support that. In fact, I would, I would say, I cannot think of a single Jew that would say, no, nope, they're not anti-ISIS. What changes the question and makes it more interesting is you know, looking what, what is actually his stance, because Obama also had an anti-ISIS stance. Hillary Clinton had an anti-ISIS stance. And I think that that's most closely defined by statements like, you kill the family, of ISIS members, right? Or of accused ISIS members. And he didn't really specify whether or not 
it mattered that those folks were American or not. And certainly in the case that he decided to just, you know, start killing the families of suspected ISIS terrorists who are American, you know, the families especially are American, you know, most Jews would come out swinging against that. Answering this question without a full understanding of what U.S.'s policy is in fighting ISIS, um, if the strategy is to focus on what really nurtures and accelerates ISIS's growth, it's about the recruitment process and their ability to survive. And so we just talked about their access to oil fields and how that's giving them money to actually run their mm -hmm. operations. And so because they're still being able to run the operation, they still have access to those oil fields, and then I would conclude that they are, the U.S. does have bad policy, mainly because it has been ineffective so far. Gotcha. As long as Assad is there, ISIS might be defeated, but they will melt down and come up again with other terrorist group as long as there are corrupt regime in Iraq and Syria. So this plan, I think his approach is not the right one. Work with the people there, work with Syrian neighbors, but you shouldn't work with Assad. He's the dictator, and the United States should always side or be on the right side of history. Uh, and I know probably one person at Freeman Center and one person at home that supported Trump and have for years been peddling a plan for the Middle East. You know, my friend from middle school that I, you know, we joked around a lot. His plan was, he called it Operation Bomb Beluga. You should bomb all of the Middle East. And I, I've never been on board with that, and most people I know haven't been, but that exists. Um, and I would say the division does ultimately fall somewhat on, on religious lines. Mm -hmm. Orthodox Jews fall more into that camp, um, especially modern Orthodox Jews. And then Reform Jews, who are the largest denomination by far in the U.S., fall into the larger camp that I dis discussed earlier. There are a lot of unaffiliated Jews that would be involved politically, um, not as much from a religious standpoint. And I think that conservative Jews, which are sort of like the middle group uh, between what's called progressive Judaism and Orthodox, um, I think that something as extreme as killing American family members of suspected terrorists, they would come out against that as well. I want to draw attention to the rise of Islamic State and how to reverse it by Professor Lowe. Throughout the paper, Professor Lowe makes the case that the United States cannot eliminate ISIS through coercive force. He wrote that, in fighting Islamic State with bad policies, the United States is nurturing the same enemy that it aims to defeat. Donald Trump's proposed foreign policy certainly would nurture not only ISIS, but militant groups throughout the Middle East. Consider the implications of, quote, bombing the hell out of ISIS, as Donald Trump puts it. ISIS controls large civilian cities like Mosul in Iraq. By bombing these cities, many innocent civilians will die as collateral damage. By killing civilians, American air, air forces would destroy public opinion of the West as innocent Iraqis would fear for their lives. After losing the public support, Actually working to end ISIS becomes even harder after losing valuable military intelligence and anti-ISIS sentiment that the public offers. And there's a new book out too uh, by one of my colleagues. It's called, and I want, to, I want this to go on camera because I think people should have this, especially the president-elect president and the rest of his cabinet should have this book. It's called Democracy, Civic Virtue, and Islam. Muslim Americans, a jihad against extremism. We have an inherent responsibility to fight against extremism ourselves. Not just the government, but we are. Let me ask you a question. Do you think Muhammad the Prophet would sit on the sidelines and let the government of Mecca 
fight this ugly behavior or would Muhammad the prophet and Khalid bin Walid and Umar take a stand? Ladder. The latter, right? That's us. We have to become Muhammad. <laughs> yeah. Allah says Muhammad is a witness to us and we have to be a witness to humanity. So that means we should be one with Muhammad. Okay? We should be one with Muhammad. We should be the, 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 the um, Abu Bakr's. We should be the Balaals. We should be the Uthmans. We should be them today in this day and time. They shouldn't just rest their character, their, their, their passion for, for human life and furtherance of our life, their passion against what's wrong. That shouldn't sit on the set shelves in books. Those books should come to life in you and I's behavior in our way that we have to go about fighting this. Well, the, the word jihad is misused, you see. Jihad has two meanings. One, the greater jihad is to struggle for a better life, but in the media it is used a holy war. Okay, we have in the Crusade War in the 12th century, we have three or five major wars to capture the Holy Land, mobilized by the papacy, by Catholic countries. It was a holy war, you see, to capture the Holy Land. So we shouldn't use this word um, erratically. We need to be very careful. So in bin Laden's uh, 1998 uh, fatwa that he issued urging jihad against Jews and crusaders, he outlines very specific grievances against American intervention and foreign policy that he claims are the reason behind his waging jihad. And uh, to quote them specifically, he says, First, for over seven years, the U.S. has been occupying the lands of Islam in the holiest of places, the Arabian Peninsula. And he goes on, Second, despite the great devastation inflicted on the Iraqi people by the Crusader Zionist Alliance, and despite the huge number of those killed, which has exceeded one million, the Americans are once again trying to repeat these horrific massacres. And third, if the Americans' aims behind these wars are religious and economic, the aim is also to serve the Jews' petty state and divert attention from its occupation of Jerusalem and murder of Muslims there. And the question is, regarding this document, what actions under the Trump administration could be cited in future jihadist indictments? And this is a very interesting question because... Um, Trump's recent Secretary of Defense pick, James Mad Dog Mattis. Um, I mean, his his nickname is Mad Dog, um, also Wild Monk or Mad Monk, something like that. So he's known as being very aggressive and cutthroat, and he has this resume of impressive things that he's done in the same campaigns that Osama bin Laden has grievances against. Um, he commanded a division of Marines in the U.S. invasion of Iraq in 2003. Um, he led a task force uh, during a raid on Afghanistan's Kandahar province. Um, but what's interesting about Mad Dog is that uh, he seems to be so right-wing that he almost doesn't fit into the conventional right-wing party lines. Um, he made stops in Israel to work with Jews and Arabs um, against Iranian influence. So Mad Dog's priorities aren't uh, the, the Sunni jihadist groups. They're more against um, Iran. He really thinks Iran is the enemy that we are not paying enough attention to. Um, he's also vocal about a two-state solution in Israel and Palestine. Um, and he has made statements accusing Israel of establishing apartheid. Um, and this drew, drew criticism from uh, the Zionist Organization of America, the Jewish Institute of National Security Affairs, and other right-wing, staunchly pro-Israel groups. So we don't really know what foreign policy under the Trump administration is going to be like in terms of the Middle East, because um, on one hand, 
the Republican Party lines are going to try their best to kind of reel Donald Trump in and kind of direct him into where they want him to go. But he's very much a wild card with a spine. I think, like, frankly, a terrifying situation for like, Muslims in America. And, like, yes, it brings up this discussion, but, like, it also means that they are facing much more, like, actual danger. Um, I, like, I think that's definitely true. Um, but I think that you shouldn't look at the U.S. just in terms of comparing comparing the U.S. with itself, because if you look at other Western countries around the world, I think that that same sort of trend towards uh, looking inwards and uh, tightening um, tightening your borders is uh, not just indicative of the U.S. So, like um, a lot of other countries who accepted a lot of refugees have dramatically gone back on their policies in accepting and I know like one country I visited um, were paying refugees to actually leave the country so I I'm not sure if like when other Muslims Muslims outside the US are looking at looking at our country um, if they'd see it as like a American thing but more of like just a global uh, change in attitude towards um, towards Muslims in general. I mean, I'd like to question the aspects of Muslims being more productively discussed in the American context and Islam being more productively discussed in the American context because if the discussion solely focus on terrorism, how productive is that? That's because true. Muslims are <laughs> individuals <laughs> who are from really diverse backgrounds and they're multifaceted and really complex and having this discussion that is so concentrated in this one negative thing I don't think does much to point out the diversity within this group and you like you can't even begin to have a conversation about who Muslims are because Muslims are just not this one thing that's so true and so because of that this discussion on terrorism and the discussion on anti-Muslim sentiments and the presence of Muslims and Islam in the American context is important, but because it's so singularly focused on this one topic, it puts Muslims constantly on the defensive. Wow, yeah. So, um, in a response to Huntington's Clash of Civilizations, uh, Edward Said wrote Clash of Ignorance, in which he said, Think of the populations today of France, Italy, Germany, Spain, Britain, America, and even Sweden, and you must concede that Islam is no longer on the fringes of the West, but at its center. What is so threatening about that presence? And this quote, um, I, I think it gives valid context as to why Muslims are so prevalent in American media, in both good or bad light. Um, Yes, it's because um, we're, there's so much conflict in the Middle East, I guess. But also because they're right here. Um, so you will always have that camp of older, more right-wing, white, poor, uneducated, the list goes on. Those kinds of people who will view and who will see a visibly distinct group of immigrants coming in and they will say, you know, they're taking your jobs, they're bringing their ideologies, their terrorists, whatever, whatever. Uh, but then you will have that wave of more urban, more liberal, more hip people um, who will commodify this avant-garde identity. Um, so yes, of course, uh, there is a backlash of solidarity and um, like, yes, as the the hate speech rises against Islam, there will be people who say, you know, we love you and we accept you and Muslims are Americans um, too, like, we welcome you. Um, and, and that's valid, but I think what's more interesting is that um, 
with with Muslims being so close and with coming here um, and with being kind of outcasts in a way, like in, in mainstream um, rhetoric, uh, they're also being commodified. So you see a lot of um, like liberal media uh, using hijabis in fashion, you know, Playboy featured a hijabi journalist. Um, it's cool now. You have like hijabi makeup gurus. It's cool because it's avant-garde. Um, <laughs> so I, I do think that it's a double-edged sword, you know, when you have, a, a, when you have such proximity to a group that is, um, so different and you have that process of assimilation, that's what we're seeing now, uh, because Muslims are kind of new to the American landscape. Um, but not really, um, they're just newer in our, um, poor memory, um, and so you do see this rise of neg negative rhetoric, but at the same time, um, that will always be met, like, that is always just a pattern, and that's just what proximity does.